Welcome to Inner Compass. I'm Shirley Hoekstra. Across the world, widows are losing their land and their livelihood, and children as young as five are being sold into brothels. However, something as simple as land reform and enforcing the laws of a country can change much of that. We're going to be talking about that today on Inner Compass. From the campus of Calvin College, this is Inner Compass, exploring how people use faith and ethics to guide them through critical issues of today. My guest today is Sharon Cohen Wu of the International Justice Mission in Washington, D.C., a human rights agency that rescues victims of violence, slavery, and oppression using local courts and litigation. Welcome, Sharon. Good morning. Welcome. You know, when you find out about people whose lives are so desperate and you hear their stories or actually meet them, this must change you in a significant way. Yeah, it's both uh, extraordinarily uh, heartbreaking, uh, especially the crimes uh, against some very small children um, or crimes against whole communities, um, but it's also an opportunity to see uh, a tremendous act of grace and to be able to celebrate with people when they get victory as well. So at the depths of this despair, and then you see people coming out and actually having a real life hope, that must be exhilarating. Yeah, there's nothing uh, I've ever done or nothing I can imagine doing that, that quite compares to uh, seeing justice for a small girl or seeing a widow get her land back, or particularly seeing slaves who have spent their entire lives uh, in a brick kiln or rock quarry under someone's crushing oppression and then to see them be free and to hear what they say and why it matters to them. It's amazing. When you talk about small children, for sex slavery, some of the children are as young as five, aren't they? Five, seven, nine. Yeah, the majority of uh, trafficking victims are probably more towards uh, 14 to 18 and even some adults, but the smallest children in the cases we've worked on, the smallest uh, girl was five years old and there were about uh, 10 girls under the age of 10. So it depends on the um, the market, really. These are pedophiles will go for the very, very small girls. Um, the girls between 13 and 17 are just customers come into the brothels and rape these girls instead of abusing other girls. So you work with local police to do the raids. Um, what is the setup that you need to do as IJM in order to get the police involved, identify the brothels, and decide where to go in? Yeah, the uh, it takes a bit of time to develop relationships with local law enforcement, um, but what we do is we research the local laws to determine what sort of evidence do you need to show that a crime's been committed. Um, our investigators will go out into the brothels and determine if there are any minors in the brothel or any women who are there against their will. Um, they'll identify those women, sometimes capturing those images on undercover tape, and then depending on what evidence the police need, uh, for to show that they've got probable cause to go into the brothel. We'll provide that to them and then work with them. Um, oftentimes we're asked to sort of assist with developing the plan um, to, uh, to raid the brothel, work with them on that. Um, the victims are then pulled out. Um, the offenders are arrested and charged under local law. And then our prosecutors will work with the local prosecutors to move those, our lawyers will work with the local prosecutors to move those cases through trial. And meanwhile, our team of social workers will work with the girls um, to bring them to a place of safety. Um, often that's a temporary aftercare and then a longer term aftercare placement. And then um, determine whether those girls can go back to their families or whether their family situation is too vulnerable and they're better off in some alternative care. So you, um, work with local attorneys and the local court system and the local police, but there is certainly a reputation that all of those entities have a level of corruption. So why do they respond to IJM in order to change their ways? Yeah, there's, um, we have about uh, close to 300 staff and most of our staff are local nationals serving in the country's um, uh, where they're from and so the our Indian staff are members of the Indian Bar for example and they'll work alongside local That's the Bar Association, the legal entity. That's right and the um, 
So they're allowed to stand up in court themselves, and they're also working alongside the prosecutors who, as in our country, have the obligation to bring cases forward that are violations of the, of the state. Um, and in every place we work, there are probably people of bad will and people of good will, right? So there are people who are committed to seeing justice in their city, and it's a question of identifying those individuals and then helping them to be empowered to do that. So sometimes it's just that the law's never been used before. It's been on the books for a long time, but it's not clear how it works. It often fails at different parts in the system. So just walking that process through with someone until you get to judgment. Um, I read that the court system, for instance, in India is just overwhelmed, that there were, it's a 20-year waiting list to have your case heard. And of course, in the United States, if you have a year or two, people think that that's far too long, and this is 20 years, or that the number of judges is so small. So maybe with IJM, when you have fresh help coming in, and people will say, look, we're going to come alongside of you, we're going to give some energy to this project, do they receive it like that? It depends, I would say. You're, you're correct in terms of the overburdening of the system. I, I think that's right. I think part of it is that the, you can help. Some of the legislation will then fall into what's called a fast track. So some of these cases, because there's sexual violence against women and children, can go to a special court, and those some of those courts move faster. It can still take us three to five years to get a, uh, from the time a person's charged to get to a decision, a conviction, or an acquittal for an individual on a single case. And that is a long time, particularly if you're the victim, right? And so you have to keep coming to court. It keeps getting delayed. Um, you can't go back to your hometown, or they're bringing you back and forth. Um, that can be really hard. I think I think what we're trying to offer is both um, help on some of the capacity side, so helping to brief some of those issues, helping to provide training to the police on, on how to uh, do victim-friendly interviews, for example, or how to sensitize the police on some of the trafficking issues. Um, and then some of it is, in some countries, we're actually able to do the prosecutions ourselves. So in the Philippines, our Filipino attorneys can be assigned essentially to be the private prosecutor. So they can take that burden off the state prosecutor and actually walk that case uh, through themselves. IJM wants to work with the rule of law within the country because you believe that if you bolster their own rule of law, the legal system there, that overall the country will be in better shape. Is that uh, receptive? I mean, are people receptive to that? Do you get government help, funding? Um, is our government interested in helping to bolster the legal communities of other countries? Yeah, I think there's a, an agreement on principle, this idea that if you cannot um, retain that which you've been given. So if you can't hold on to let's say, the house you've been, that's been built or you can't walk securely to school without, you won't send your kids to school because you're afraid as they walk on their way, they're gonna be assaulted, um, a, a little child will be sexually assaulted. So there's an agreement in principle that the law actually needs to work. But what happens instead is that um, a lot of NGOs and a lot of organizations work to protect their people from the law. So I think it's the World Bank that says that the police are actually a source of insecurity in many places, not a source of security. And it's, in some ways, it's very, um, it's hard to reorient ourselves because for most of us, if we have a problem, the police are someone we run to and not run away from. But in many places, the actually the police are individuals who are profiting from the crime um, and are certainly not securing protection for the poor. And so I think fundamentally there's an agreement, but it's a question of how do you work that out? How do you make it so that the public justice system works effectively and sustainably for the poor? And there are many parts of the system that are broken. And so how you work with each of those parts and you partner with all of the relevant agencies and all the individuals who want to see that work, how can you do that effectively? And when you interviewed missionaries and NGO, um, non-governmental organization uh, individuals, when you interviewed them, they all knew that there was this corruption and sort of had thrown up their hands saying, well, we can't do anything about that. So do they look at you in a cynical way and say, oh, they are, this is a pie in the sky idea about changing this fundamental system in this country? I think that there's a, a, a healthy skepticism of the idea that you can, um, in some places, that the, the police will protect the poor because there is legitimate um, experience to say otherwise, to say that no, the best we can do is keep our people away from intersecting with the government, particularly intersecting with the public uh, justice system. But on the other hand, the relief and development organizations we've worked with or the people that bring referrals to us say, can you please 
help this woman. Her land has been taken. Her brother-in-law has uh, beaten her up and thrown her off the land. Can you help her get her land back? And nothing other than the law has the power to get that back, right? So negotiations work uh, up to a point, but when you get someone more powerful and someone with no power at all, only the law can actually bring some level of, of, uh, of balance to that. How do you fund such work? I mean, so not only doing the legal work, but you're saying, boy, here are uh, individuals that need constant help. Yeah, the aftercare, particularly for the victims of commercial sexual exploitation, um, can be very challenging because you have individuals who haven't just been um, raped or raped uh, multiple times, but they've been in a serious, uh, they've been in a situation of sort of serial rape, of just being constantly exploited for a number of years. And we've had girls in the brothels for four, five, six, even longer um, number of years. And so uh, when they come out, they have, uh, a lot of them have PTSD, uh, or at least symptomatic of PTSD. They've got... So post-traumatic stress disorder. That's right. So they've got... Um, certainly trauma-related stress, they've got medical symptoms, they've got um, psychosocial uh, problems, and they, as you said, may have had no formal education at all and no, voca no vocational skills. So it's a multifaceted challenge. Um, we partner with organizations in each of the countries uh, where we do work on commercial sexual exploitation, and the and people are just learning, like what is necessary for these girls? How can we serve them best? What does this look like? And I'd say the two areas where there's still quite a bit of need is um, on trauma care for these girls, and then also for the step from the aftercare home to independent living. So is that in a community setting, a uh, women's hostel, for example, microcredit so that the business that they start can take off and be successful. But there's a lot of complexities involved in aftercare for these girls. IGM is also trying to change this balance of power, power so that the perpetrator also has to have this accountability. You're trying to make it more expensive, riskier in order to do this business. Do you see results of that? We've seen great results on perpetrator accountability and uh, making the individual uh, recalculate whether it's profitable to sell um, children to the brothels. So for example, in Cambodia, we had um, a case where 13 offenders were arrested, um, 37 girls were rescued. Um, we had two trials. I was able to be present at both of those trials, um, though obviously since we don't practice laws in those countries, the lawyers, the prosecutors there were doing the case. but. In the first case, it was an area called um, Sve Pak, which was a very um, lively brothel community, actually, and it was well known on the internet and other places to go if you wanted to exploit uh, young children, right? So um, during this first trial, like the community itself showed up to Phnom Penh Municipal Court and they're all sort of looking around because they had, there they were seeing their colleagues on trial, and there they were seeing their colleagues get questioned by the judge and suddenly their colleagues are being convicted and, and marched off to jail. And you saw on the website, stay away from Sve Pak, there's, the, you'll be arrested. It's dangerous there for other reasons. Exactly. And that's just a great message for those kids, right? Because if the offenders have something to fear, then the children have less to fear. And, um, and we see those changes. Now they come incrementally over time, but we actually see um, when we do undercover investigations in those same areas, we'll hear, no, no, no kids here. No, the police will not let us have children here. Go somewhere else. And they'll do the universal sign for getting arrested. You'll go off to jail. You, you go somewhere else. And we've been kicked out of communities looking for girls because kids aren't allowed there anymore. It's an interesting educational tool, isn't it? So you have to educate people um, uh, you know, about disease or uh, uh, jobs and so on. But now you're educating perpetrators that say, hey, look, this is dangerous. Don't go in here. And uh, that's a fascinating way to use the uh, courts to educate that this is not profitable and this will, this will harm you. Not only the harm the the victims, but this will harm you. Absolutely, and it's a billions of dollars a year in profit. So if you get someone to recalculate, yes, okay, there's a potential for profit, but there's actually a credible risk. I might go to jail for committing this crime. Um, they do tend to to recalculate that, and we've been um, pleased with what we've seen in that. Gary Haugen, the, the founder of International Justice Mission, was asked to look at the Rwandan genocide and and do the sort of investigation on that, and that profoundly changed his life. And uh, since 1997, when IJM was founded, you have been going into areas where this kind of genocide has happened, this rule of law has not been established. Do you find that your organization has captured the hearts of American Christians to say this is important work? Well, we've been very um, 
encouraged and amazed by this rising um, tide of concern for justice in the American church. And I imagine you've seen it uh, here. And while Calvin, of course, has had such a role in sort of promoting uh, the call for justice in Christians, but this idea that there's more than just me and mine to be concerned about and that look at this great big world. And I think one of the ways you can start is if you just believe what you read in the scriptures and you read how many times it says that God hates injustice and you look at that and you say, if you just go by pure numbers next to idolatry, injustice it, just by counting is uh, among the things that God most despises. And you, and we, we have seen an increase in interest, an overwhelming increase in interest. I don't think it's just IJM. I think there's a the, the American church is just sort of standing up and saying, we want to be counted on this. Like well, the globe than. is getting smaller. And so we read about these things. We see the pictures in our magazines and on the news. And you say, how can these things go on in Somalia? How can they right. go on all in all parts of the world? And what's our responsibility? Right. You know, as human beings, two fellow human beings, whether you're a person of faith or not, right. you have to say, God must say, what are you doing down there, people? Don't you see the hurt? hurting world, what's your response? And also that it's doable, right? Because it's one thing you can see one tragedy after another uh, on TV and go, and you sort of have this cathartic experience because you've seen it and you cried and you're done, you know? And But there's a sense that, no, no, actually, if I just put my shovel to it, I can add something uh, to what the, the church is trying to do in the world. I can be the goodness of God in this person in this terrible situation. And what is it that they really want? Well, a person in slavery, what is it they really want? They'd really like not to be a slave. So maybe that's the thing I'm called to do. Or maybe it's something else. I'm excellent in, in business. Maybe what I'm called to do is make credible this idea that these people, that they can be employed, that there's a good job for them, that they can have dignity for their family and work. And I think anybody has excellence to offer. Everybody has a call to offer excellence in what, in what they bring. Do you think that people wonder whether you're uh, the, the victim or whether you're a person who's working with victims? You sometimes say, well, where is God in all of this? You know, if there is a God, why is all of this horror happening? Yeah, there's, you know, you. It's overwhelming, right, to see, because you just can't believe what people do to one another. Like, these are not accidents of nature. This is not the tsunami, right? These are people making, the only reason that this is happening is because someone made a decision to do evil to someone else, right? And it does make you sort of, um, not wonder about the goodness of God, but wonder how God delays his fury at it. Because if you think what it is to see a child, uh, a seven-year-old in a brothel and what it does to you. And you're just the small creature who has a limited perspective. You can, I just imagine at the, at the grief and fury of God over it. Because um, God says to us, what are you doing? You know, this is not unknown to you. Right. You know, children of mine, go do something. Right. right. And I don't, I don't think there's any one of us that doesn't have some capacity to um, to be a light of justice in their community or wherever they're sent, right? I think we all can add to that um, equation on the side of justice um, because what is required is for everyone else to do nothing, right? That's right. the way injustice prevails is just you, you sit there and go, that's, that's awful. Right. Um, the other thing is that I think the, the clients that we make are not in the same level of despair as we often allow ourselves to be over the injustice, right? They just want you to do something. Like, they're fascinated at how hard it is for you psychologically, and it must be really hard on your faith. But really, in the end, like, just do what, what it is you do. You have more power than I do. And in a lot of cases, you have more power than the person who's oppressing me. Why aren't you using it? Right. Like, why Claim are you it. so nervous about what it is that you've been given, either by the law or uh, just by your standing? Go use that thing for people who have none um, and change that for them. Has IGM been criticized for not being concerned about injustice in the United States? Like, look, there's all these things that are going on here. Why are you going overseas? Yeah, we're asked about that. But I think if you just do an evaluation of resources, we wanted to go to the place where we perceived there was the greatest need. And there are, are, are many people doing very good things here in the United States and in other places as well. But we felt that given the need of the tens of millions of slaves, hundreds of thousands of orphans, millions of girls being um, assaulted, illegally detained, torture, abuse, that we, we wanted to go there. Do you have to have a certain level of safety in a country before you'll enter into it? If, if it's a war a zone, you say, look, we just can't get in there now. How do you pick and choose what countries you're going to work in? 
Yeah, it's less a safety matter than it is that we, our model is to work with local authorities to make the public justice systems work for the poor. So if it's not clear who the local authorities are in the sense that it's a, a conflict zone, it, it often isn't, um, isn't possible to do that. You have to wait till there's some level of stability uh, in the country in order to be able to work with the government to make these changes. Now you've been praised for the fact that IGM has never forgotten the victim. You know, you, you are victim related first. But when you talk about, uh, and when we know that we have to change a system, do you also work with the high powers of a particular government in order to bring your message, like you gotta change, put some resources here? Uh, absolutely, and and in fact, you you won't be successful even if all your if what you're trying to do is help the victim, but you have no relationships with people in power. You you can't actually help the victim that much in in a lot of these systems. So we'll uh, meet with prime ministers or, or heads of state or in whatever strat of government, local officials, uh, federal officials, depending on how the, the country is set up, um, in order to um, get buy-in and get partnership and cooperation to, to help on this problem, both for the individual victim, but also, hey, what are some ways that we can partner together um, so that the social services, the Department of Social Services can better serve these clients, or so that the courts have the uh, capacity to take this increased caseload of sexual violence. We don't want to create a problem by identifying all these crimes and then there'd be no resources attached to, to providing any help for them at all. So let us know how can we do this together in a measured, uh, meaningful way that's sustainable. So what governments do you find are moving towards um, more corrupt to less corrupt in terms of their prison systems and, and are really seeing the vision that IJM has for this? Well, I would say we have um, very positive relationships in all the countries that we are working. I would say if you look at what Cambodia was doing on sex trafficking back in 2002 and what it's doing now in 2009, that you would see a significant change in the response, both um, from the government, from local officials within the government, and also from the responding NGO community. I'd say there's significant, that's probably the most, uh, partly because it's a small country and it, so much goes on in Phnom Penh, but you could see a, a market difference um, there. But I think also uh, in places we're working in Guatemala City, uh, we see um, changes in there. Even in places where we're relatively new, as in Bolivia, we've had, we work on sexual violence there, but we've also had the police come to us and ask us for assistance on a few trafficking cases that they were working on, and we've seen um, increase in activity in those places as well as um, some of the land issues in Uganda and Zambia. So I would say not just on sexual exploitation but on, on all of the t case types that we're working on we've seen movement, yeah. Well land ownership helps people gain wealth and, and it, with land ownership if you're cultivating your land, if you're going in and you have, don't have someone coming in and taking it away from you, um, you will invest in that and you will uh, sort of grow the prosperity of your region. Right. So land ownership is really so fundamental to the growth of a civil society, isn't it? Absolutely. And Hernando de Soto and some of these folks have written about the importance of land titling, so your ability to invest in the, the capital on the title. But on the other end, the it's a life or death matter, actually, for a widow to be tossed off her land, right? So you can look at it as sort of the building of capital, but also if your only source of income was the two rooms of your three-room house that you rented out to boarders, and then someone comes and throws you and your children off the land, you can literally starve to death from having no other resources in a community that simply can't pick up individuals that fall out of those systems because everyone relied on their land. So it's both the wealth and just the abject misery and poverty that comes from being taken off of it. And sometimes it's a matter of having a good recording system for your land titles. This is something that in some ways seems so mundane to us as Americans, you know, well, of course you have a, a land system that works. You can trace records like who owned it before. But even in America, it was sort of at the time of Abraham Lincoln where states were saying, look, we need to have the right kind of title system, who owns what. And so now when we can bring that to countries where you can depend on if I buy it, I will own it, and no one more forceful than I am will take it away from me because there's a record, I own it, and it's official. Right. And that seems to me to be the kind of, it, it, it's not about corruption or being outdated, it's a resource issue. Right. Can we come in and help you set that up? 
Right. I, I think you're absolutely right. And there are a number of injustices that actually are less because of uh, corruption in the system than, than either apathy or just someone with slightly more power will overpower. It doesn't take that much power to take land away from a widow, but the truth is it doesn't take that much power to take it away from the bully who took it away from the widow, right? Right. Um, now, I know you all have a partnership with the Association for a More Just Society in Honduras. They're doing a lot of the land titling uh, work in Tegucigalpa, and we had been doing uh, work with them over a number of years in uh, land titling as well and you see you can see whole communities change just from the uh, just from being awarded title by the government because it says it's yours no one can take it away from you it's worth caring for it's worth investing in you can send your kids to school by borrowing off of it um, it's vital to a growth of a community so you're really building the capacity for judicial work to happen Right, and for sustainability in that, right? So there should come to the day that at best we're sort of the an ombudsman function in a, in a country, but now not just our clients, but non-clients can walk through the system and get justice in it because there have been some changes to procedures, some increases in resources and, and other things that now make it possible for any mother to bring her child who's been raped uh, to a police station, get good care. Um, the, the government provides good services for her daughter and she can walk through that system to judgment. So that's the goal. Um, so USAID, um, I'm a, a citizen, I wanna write my congressman, my representative, my senator, yeah. and say, look, I want you to think about US government funding some better judicial systems. Can that happen? Are we doing that as a US government? There is some monies going into rule of law. I think the challenge is, is to have those programs require the level of accountability that shows this many individuals under this level of income were uh, provided these types of services when they went through the justice system. Because it does take some intense monitoring of what does that look like in police station A for a person of no means who's never intersected with the law. What does that actually look like and how is it different this year than it was three years ago based on your program? And I think that's a lot of it. Are you investing in the, in the local justice systems, which is what most directly impacts the daily life of the poor, um, and seeing how those programs work? I think you can ask about that. Thank you. My guest today has been Sharon Cohen Wu of the International Justice Mission in Washington, D.C. I'm Shirley Hoekstra, and thank you for watching Inner Compass.